I will uh, start uh, uh, already with the introduction. So welcome to the first uh, R&D parallel session from this Lepton Photon uh, conference, uh, fully online. Um, as I said already, the agenda of the schedule is quite tight, so we should really stick to, to time. You will get some notes on your screen with the time left uh, for your contributions. And then I... will Happy and glad to introduce the first speaker, which is uh, uh, Yuri Venturini from Khan, who is going to uh, introduce us a uh, new readout system. Uh, please, uh, Yuri, uh, whenever you can. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, let me know when you see uh, the full screen of my presentation. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, uh, so hello again, everybody. Uh, let me first thank the organizers for giving me a slot to give a talk at this conference. Uh, my name is Yuri Venturini, and I am a sales manager and application scientist at Kain. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Kain is an Italian electronic instrumentation provider for nuclear and particle physics. And today I will present one of our recent developments called FIRST. 5200, that is a distributed front end readout system for multi detector arrays. Yeah. The aim uh, of this brief talk is to try answering a, a question that is, uh, what is the most convenient way to read out a large array of detectors in physics experiments? In the traditional approach to this kind of problem, we usually find fully analog front end boards near the detectors and then long cables bringing the amplified analog signals to a set of rack electronics, usually uh, several separate boards performing different measurements like ADC, TDC, etc. cetera. Um, this approach has uh, some main issues like signal attenuation along the cables, uh, noise pickup, ground loops, and last but not least, also the cost for the overall installation. That is why uh, we developed uh, a platform called FIRST 5200, that is a modular readout system for large uh, arrays of detector. Um, the system is built with a basic brick, the first unit, that is a compact card integrating an ASIC to read out a specific detector together with AD conversion and communication protocols. Uh, these compact cards feature a quite dense channels count, uh, 64 or 128 each, and can be spread over uh, a large surface or a large volume, uh, that is the detector of the experiment itself, uh, can be placed near the detector, and then they can be all read out at once through a concentrated board that is far away from the detector. Uh, the front end cards and the concentrator uh, communicate each other using optical fibers, so that uh, up to 16 first units can be daisy chained and read out by a single optical link. Uh, the concentrator has eight optical links in total, meaning that it is possible to scale the system to uh, several thousands of readout channels uh, quite easily. The readout protocol uh, going over fiber is a kind of proprietary protocol. It's called TD-Link and it serves as readout and synchronization of the first units at once. The concentrated board, in addition, has uh, an embedded arm uh, that allows to run middleware on board, for example, uh, for even building data reduction and some other operations. Um, you can see that this platform is quite versatile, uh, as you can connect a single first unit directly to a PC through USB, for example, to evaluate its performance that could be useful in the, in the R&D phase. Uh, and then you can expand the system by adding as many first units as you need uh, to read out your detector, while the concentrator board automatically manages readout and synchronization far away from the detector. Given that uh, we will develop different first units for different applications, the keyword here is Flexibility. Uh, flexibility is guaranteed by the architecture of the first unit. Um, and in effect, we design it with a detector specific part based on an ASIC to read out a specific detector 
or to perform specific man, um, specific measurements and a common infrastructure that remains the same in all cases. Uh, for example, the IO sports, communication links, and so on. Uh, in this way, we will have the possibility to build a complete range of uh, first units for different detectors by simply integrating uh, new ASICs in the detector specific part. Uh, and in effect, the first unit's architecture is explicitly designed to exploit the partnership between Kyan and ASIC vendors. Uh, the first unit of this family is called A15, uh, A5202, sorry, uh, is already available and it is based on the CityRock chip made by WeRock. Uh, it is for the readout of SIPMs. It's a, a 64 channel board. Uh, we already have in the pipeline two more units. Um, one is the CERN, Pico, is based on the CERN Pico TDC for uh, picosecond resolution timing. And one is based on the WeRock GemRock chip, which is for the readout of gems. Clearly, given the requests coming from the experiments and their timeline, uh, our schedule can be flexible as well. And we are more than available to discuss if a particular chip that is not in our plans could be of real interest for the, for the community. As I mentioned before, uh, the first first unit on the market is called A5202, and it's a 64 channel SIPM readout board based on two uh, CTROC ASICs. It can perform energy, energy measurements with single photo electrons resolution and time stamping with 0.5 nanosecond granularity. Uh, it also feature an embedded high voltage source to bias the silicon photomultipliers and different readout ports uh, that are USB, Ethernet, and the optical link. Therefore, uh, in one single board, you have a SIPM bias and readout, just simply connecting it to the, to the board input. Uh, here in the picture, you see it as a bare PCB uh, that is quite useful if you have to arrange it in custom mechanical frames, but we also have a desktop version that is ideal for R&D and prototyping. Briefly, let's see now some results that we obtained with this, with this board. Here we see some typical qualification plots of silicon photomultipliers made with an Amamatsu matrix illuminated by an LED light source in the center. And the A5202 is making the biasing and readout. And it is possible to see that the electronics is able to resolve single photoelectron peaks uh, in the spectrum and in the surcase and it is good for imaging too. Another uh, test we made was the measurements of cosmic ray energy using two plastic scintillators coupled to silicon photomultipliers. And as you can see in the plot, we were able to measure the Landau distribution of relativistic muons uh, loss of energy. Uh, we have already successfully deployed the first platform in several applications where a SIPM readout is involved. Here I cite just the most important ones. Um, five units, for example, were used in a dual readout hadron calorimetry prototype made by ENFN and University of Insubria in Italy. Uh, another more industrial oriented application is a muon tomography scanner for nuclear waste characterization made by Linkeos, uh, which is a spin-off of the University of Glasgow. Um, and there we will end up with nearly 20 boards running together to detect the muon signals and make imaging as you see in this picture. Uh, to conclude, the last application I want to mention is the European Union uh, Mikado project, where Kain is the leading partner. Uh, the project aims at building a reference process and instrumentation for decommissioning in nuclear power plants. And in this framework, some first units have been already tested and proved uh, suitable for integration in more complex detection system that will be used in nuclear power plants. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we can say that the electronics I just presented is modular uh, because it's made of different pieces that you can add or remove according to, to your needs. It is easy scalable because thanks to the concentrator board and TD link, 
it is straightforward to handle several thousands of channels. And finally, it is flexible thanks to the ASIC based architecture that will allow to achieve a, a complete range uh, of units for different detectors and applications. Okay, that was my last slide. Thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm available for questions, if any. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jory. Uh, I don't see any hand raised. Uh, I have probably just one uh, question, which is about the um, custom uh, made detector specific infrastructure. When you develop them for each application, uh, do you do all the R and D uh, yourself, or do you uh, rely on the uh, on your partners for the specific application to do that? No, the the R and D is uh, in house in Kyan. Uh, what we do is just to take off the shelf ASIC from other vendors. For example, I cited two here: We Rock and CERN, uh, and we integrate in the in the infrastructure. But the infrastructure is a kind R and D is completely our IP, so we can we can handle it uh, also for custom applications if needed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to you. I am afraid we have to move forward to the uh, next uh, speaker because of the of the as I said again the, the schedule is quite tight the agenda. So the next speaker is Tonya Folder uh, from Santa Cruz and. Is going to summarize for us the Atlas Space 2 upgrade. Thank you very much. Now, Tony, I cannot hear you. Can yeah, you can you hear me? Am I muting? Yeah. It wasn't working right. Give me a second. So, sure. So, thank you all and good morning. Um, Tony Affelder, I'm going to give you a short status and overview of the Atlas Phase 2 upgrades. So, the first question is why would you want to make this? So the, the high Lumi LHC is going to provide a tenfold increase of integrated luminosity, enabling a broad program covering all areas of hydrogen collider physics for Atlas and CMS and LHCP. Um, so the installation of the upgrade will begin sometime in the mid 2020s. It's still under discussion right now. And the operation should commence before the end of the decade, running for about 10 years. So the highlights will include measurements of Higgs boson properties. So in the yellow paper, a lot, a lot of the focus has been on um, the coupling constants you can get at. So this is at the end of 3,000 of the inverse femto barns for Atlas and CMS combined, and you can get to 2 to 4% on the Higgs couplings, which can give you some signs for new physics. There's also measurements planned for self-coupling, uh, precision electroweak measurements in the vector boson scattering, searches for new physics and flavor studies. Um, there's some recent public studies I don't have enough time to go into, uh, which you could look at here, um, that are looking at Higgs to BB and Charm Charm, and looking more at the WW production and photon scattering. So the Atlas upgrade is mostly going to be electronics, but there are three um, different detector elements that the sense elements will be changed. So in the muon detector shown in red, the inner barrel ranger's uh, uh, region will be adding um, resistive plate chambers, drift tubes, and triple gems. And the goal is to improve the trigger efficiency and momentum resolution and reduce the fake rate. The inner detector has to be completely replaced due to the, the radiation environment, the occupancy we're gonna see. We're taking the opportunity to increase the coverage up to eight of four with at least um, four layers of hits for each um, and doing that while still maintaining less material and finer segmentation. And then finally in green, um, we're adding a, a timing detector, which provides um, time reconstruction of, of about uh, 30 picoseconds per track using low gain average photodiodes. Um, and it's used to improve the pileup separation and bunch, bunch luminosity amongst other things. And then finally, the entirety of the electronics are updated to allow us to read out a 40 megahertz continuous with finer segmentation to the trigger. And this is for the muons, the tile calmeter, and the liquid arc on calmetry. And, and then the DAQ and trigger is uh, enhanced and improved um, to take this. So we're trying to get to a megahertz trigger output for a single level trigger and improving our event farm for reconstruction. So going inside out, the ITK completely replaces the inner detector. It's gonna be about 180 square meters of silicon, which is almost three times as big as the previous system. Um, one thing we are able to do is improve the impact parameter resolution shown here, which is like 60% of what it was in 
from the current atlas. We're doing that by doing two things. One is by reducing the material, and you can see in particular in this forward region, the materials reduce as much as half to a factor of four, depending on where you look. Um, in addition, we have a, a inner pixel layer that uh, has a segmentation of 25 microns and the bend direction of the magnet. Um, and this all leads to this um, impact parameter resolution improvement um, at 100 GV muons. Um, so the asymptotic improve, uh, improvements you can get. So the coverage is shown here. The black is your, uh, what we have currently, and the red is what we'll have in the future. This is the efficiency versus eta for top events for tracks above 1 GV. And what you can see is even though we're a pileup of 200, we're almost maintaining the same efficiency for these tracks while increasing the coverage with that efficiency all the way up to four. So recent progress that we've gotten to is we've made realistic um, manifolds and capillaries for all our different systems. This shows you the silica strip end cap. And we're making first production units so that this is the outer cylinder that we're using to hold the entirety of the IPK. So going into details of the systems for pixels, um, the new thing that we have um, for the shear is a joint Atlas CMS effort making a full-size pixel chip in TSMC 65 nanometer. It has over 150,000 pixels per chip, allowing for one megahertz readout and a very low threshold, which we need for um, the expected signal we're gonna have. So we've shown that it works well for irradiation and the average chip yield shown here is over 75%, which is better than we thought it would be. So it's working very well. Um, for sensors, um, we typically have 50 by 50 micron pixels, um, both in 3D technology and planar. Um, for the 3D shown with this FBK pre-production sensor, we already have the pre-production in hand and have 67% yield for each of these tiles, which again was better than we were planning for. So this is working really well. And then for planar, we've made a, a, a series of uh, prototype units. This is one from Hamamatsu. And these are in order, um, being ordered right now for pre-production. So finally, um, we've made first uh, prototypes with RD53A chip, which isn't full size, it's about a quarter, and the, um, the ITK PIX V1. This shows you a ring triple module um, for the inner region of the detector, and then quad modules, which has four chips um, per sensor unit, which is the, the building block, the main building block of the detector. So in mechanics, um, there's three different systems, each with different mechanical systems. There's a replaceable inner system, an outer end cap, and an outer barrel. And for each of these, we had to show that the thermal properties and performance is what we'd, we'd hope, because they're all fairly new and with uh, using advanced materials. So we've made a thermal demonstration of the outer barrel, the inner, inner system, and the end caps, which I can't show because there's only so many pictures I can show. But they all meet specifications. And because of this, pre-production is beginning on all these mechanics. Um, we've taken the quads I showed you earlier and strung them together into zero power chains, which is how we'll power the units. And these are under test right now. And finally, all the cabling that we need, which is unique to each individual ring are, or each layer, um, they're all being made and final designs are in hand. So moving on to strips. Um, the thing that we've been really working on lately is a redesign of the chips increased chip location um, to improve um, SE performance, um, both in the logic controls and the clocks. So this plot here shows you the, the ABC star, which is uh, in, in completed pre-production and production started. Um, so this has worked really well. So this is the cross section of SEU use um, across different register types that we have and different operating scenarios. So the yellow shows you the prototype chip we had where we didn't have full triplication. And what you can see is we were seeing SEEs, depending on which register and how we operated it, at somewhere between 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 14 level. So then with the full triplication, we ran four different chips, which is showing you these, these here. And all, we never measured a single SEU in our a campaign at, um, in Canada. And so uh, we only have lower bounds. And then to show that it actually works and the way that we check the triplication is working is we disable individual clocks. And when you disable the individual clocks, you do see SEUs again. So that's all working very well. The yield has been excellent and we have a 92% yield per chip and these chips are in production. We received the first lots uh, two weeks ago. And then we did the same redesign using the same um, toolkit from CERN for triplication 
for the HEC and EMAX star. These have just arrived right after, um, well, New Year's Eve day, and we're testing those right now. So a huge amount of progress has happened in, in modules and mechanics. We made our first electrical pedal now that we have each of the different sensor types, which are six, made in pre-production for the first time. So we allowed us to make all nine module types and all 13 hybrids and check it electrically and it all works fine. So what we did do then was we um, irradiated a module, um, in this case, a short strip module, which has um, two hybrids in the barrel. And we measured its efficiency versus threshold and its noise occupancy versus threshold um, after irradiating it to 1.5 times the maximum fluence. So what the requirement is that you have to have a, a efficiency greater than 98%, which is shown in this curve here. So any thresholds below that point has that. And here shows the noise occupancy. We need to have a noise occupancy less of 10 to the minus three. And so we have this wide open operating window for the detector at end of lifetime. So everything, again, is as expected in design. Um, hybrids and modules have gone into pre-production. So this shows you a, a panel of six hybrids that we use for testing. And the bottom here shows you um, the noise of all the pre-production parts made so far. So it's 112 hy like hybrids, um, 1,120 chips. And it shows you that the noise is very regular um, in Gaussian to four orders of magnitude. So this worked even better than we hoped. Um, and then we've made pre-production modules. So the local mechanics is also in pre-production. We've had parts made in industry for the, the cores that hold these um, carbon fiber cores that hold these pedals. And the global mechanics are in production. So this shows you the wheels of the end cap where they're machining the precision linking part points now. And they're gonna start building up the system that we could, will actually install. So for the time detector, it's a new detector. Um, it covers an area of 2.4 to four. Each hit has a resolution of uh, about 70 picoseconds or better. And there's four layers. Of, of silicon modules with at least two hits to get to the resolution of uh, an average of uh, 30 picoseconds per track. What we're trying to do here is reduce the pileup. So the, the, the black line shows you versus ADA what we would have um, a, a reference for this ITK. When you had the, the timing detector and especially in the forward regions, you reduce the, the pileup um, rate for jets um, in half. So you'd be able to identify them half the time which is useful um, for the forward physics program. So the current status is that we have Ultrarock chips here, which is the front end chip, full-sized and checked against um, full-sized uh, LGATs. And they're demonstrated the required resolution so far. One thing we did find in um, testing results is we were having failures, regular failures of our, of our sensors. So when, what would happen, a particle would go through, um, the field would collapse, and it put the full field potential across the front of the, the, the sensor and, and blow a hole in it effectively. Um, so what they found was um, as long as the, the, the field is less than like uh, 11 volts per micron, um, this effect wouldn't happen. And, and so, and luckily the prototype sensors are already in hand meet the radiation tolerance requirements below this critical field. So we're proceeding knowing that we have to keep operations below a certain um, bias voltage. And then the design of the mechanics about modules and services are proceeding. And this shows you a thermal demonstrator um, where they're trying to see um, if the cooling works as intended. So for liquid argon, um, the issue here is the pile up and trying to keep the resolution to what we have now. So phase two is shown in and this is for gamma gamma for Higgs. And it shows you the, the, the stimulated resolution in run two. And with the updated detector, um, with an improvement in the constant term of, of a systematic, you could see that um, you can get to the same resolution at 200 microns pile up, which is excellent. Now, how they do that is by modifying the front end to a large extent. So there's a, a preamp shaper made in um, TSMC 130. They have made a prototype of that shown here, um, which just shows you the signal um, from the detector you would get um, for this and the, and the noise amplitude, which is uniform in medium specifications. So in addition, the, the, one of the main improvements is they went to a, a, a dual range overlapping ADC with 14 bits gains, which means that they don't have the, currently they have a three, um, three overlapping gains and it trans, uh, 
it translates between two gains in this region, adding a, a fairly large system act to understanding the energy at um, where you'd want to see it for gamma Higgs to gamma K. So the, the prototype chip, the version three, um, just meets um, the requirements of having 11 equivalent bits at six megahertz, um, which is good, but they were able to make some improvements um, in a version four that they submitted and just received and will be under test. Um, so what they hope to do is to put these into a, a front end test board, which will be a quarter of the fully loaded object and demonstrate how this works together this year. So in a Hadron tile community, again, the upgrade is again to get to everything to 40 megahertz. There's some differences here is they modified the mechanics shown here into uh, many drawers that allow them to access and maintain this electronics during operations um, and shorter shutdowns. And they all have to do this because they're already replacing 10% of the PMTs um, due to uh, losses due to radiation damage. So most of the undetector items are in pre-production. These are pictures of all of them. Um, the many, uh, the data boards themselves are nearly complete in prototype and will be reviewed soon and go into pre-production itself. And the many drawers are in production, um, the mechanical elements. So the big thing that they've done here is that they ran all the electronics together at a test beam, the PSP, uh, P, and it performs as expected. So this shows you um, performance plots of two different um, segmentations of the energy, where they, which enables them to separate hadrons, electrons, and muons. And this behaves exactly like it did in the current experiment. So um, at 40 megahertz output. So this is all great. And then the off detector electronic prototypes are under evaluation as well. So it's showing you low voltage and high voltage supplies and such. For the muons, um, the, the, the new chambers make a, a, a huge improvement in the trigger efficiencies. So the, they add drift chambers into this region here, as well as RPCs, and then triple gems in this forward region here. And so what this shows you here in red is the run to level zero efficiency relative to the offline efficiency we get in the muon chambers. And you can see that it has dips in coverage. And since it's you require all three chambers, um, the efficiency tops out at about 80%. Um, percent. With these new extra chambers, and you can go to three to four logic, you get to close to, to 95% on the efficiency and the coverage is fairly uniform. So the current status depends on which part of the system we're talking about. For the drift chambers, drift tubes, um, the chambers are in production. And here's a picture of the team making these at Michigan um, with two different like chambers that they've made. The wire pitch stability has been excellent, showing that they can keep within like nine microns. For the RPCs, they're in the more of a prototyping stage. Um, the, the front end is in pre-prototype. The designs here, it's submitted. We're waiting for the receive that currently. Um, the readout board that would take this is also in prototyping. And for the triplets, um, the triplet production uh, prototype is complete and it's under test. It shows you a picture here. Um, and the ASICs production has been complete for quite a while. Um, and the boards that are that they're assembled on are shown here. So these are the actual um, front end ASICs. So finally, uh, for the DAQ, um, we have to upgrade the trigger and the DAQ to handle all this new um, data um, and density that we're flowing through this. Um, so it exploits the full granularity in a single level trigger, it improves the million trigger efficiency with the new chambers being made available to it, and it uses the trick extended um, tracking coverage. So one new thing is um, between the custom electronics and the DAQ, there's a common board for Atlas, which is a custom designed PCI board using a commodity server called a Felix, which is here. And then what's different for each board for each system is the firmware. So it's easier to maintain and uh, replace fault failed units. So the really great thing that they've done here is the data rates and how they improved it. So this shows you what we hope to do um, at level zero at trigger relative to what we have at, at the LHC currently. And so we increased the latency by a factor of four, which allows us to take um, the trigger um, rate that we can accept up by a factor of 10, giving us a whole avenue to new physics that we can um, look at. And you can see that requires a 20-fold increase in the, the amount of data we have to push through per second, um, which is a lot of work. Um, for the event farm, again, we increase things by a factor of 10. So the current status is there's prototypes of each of these boards, the Felix, the FX, 
from which it, and it's a trigger trigger board, a muon trigger board, and a, the global trigger board for the common tree. So they're all under evaluation. So, including, um, we're making significant like progress for the upgrade um, to cope and thrive in the the HLHE environment. So we're making new chambers for the inner tracker of the timing detector and muons. And replacing most of the front end electronics um, to allow the full detector information to the trigger. Um, and this successful upgrade will enable us to maximize physics potential to the future. So that's what I have. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. And are there any questions? It was a, a, a very nice summary. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Just one question. I think that you said it, but I, I probably missed it. Regarding the, the LGATS uh, failure, that they have to be operated with a field that is below 11 volts uh, per micron. Um, what happens if they go over? So what happens is there's a statistical chance per particle goes through um, that the ionizing uh, radiation We'll hit the particular part of the detector, which will collapse the field. So basically, uh, you'll get the the full um, bias potential across a small region, and it, it it will crater the detector. So you could actually physically see a hole in the detector as it goes into breakdown, and it's permanently non-working. Okay. Okay. So we're going to break down, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty. You know, it's pretty catastrophic. Um, and so it was just statistically happening and it depended on basically just rate of particles. So once they figured that out, they, they had the study where they, had, they have different thicknesses of LGADs they're considering and it all followed this curve. The, the one at the very top didn't run the failure, um, but it's consistent with this pattern. Okay. And I think CMS is seeing the same thing. So it's just a pretend now, yeah, a I design did, aspect yeah. of, of, of LGADs, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I don't see any other uh, hands uh, raised. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very nice uh, summary. Thank you, Tony. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we move to the next uh, speaker, which is Christina Agapopoulos from CNRS uh, RS in France. And she's uh, going to talk about the uh, IGPU high level trigger one for the upgraded uh, LHCB. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me and see my slides. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, so yes, uh, I will be uh, giving you a brief uh, overview of the uh, GPU uh, high-level first uh, trigger for the upgraded LHCB detector. And uh, just before going into the details, I would just uh, like to remind you a bit, uh, a few things about uh, the LHCB detector at CERN and why it is getting upgraded. So as uh, most of you know, uh, this detector is uh, located at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And as you can see in the schematic, it's a single arm uh, forward spectrometer for high precision uh, flavor physics. Uh, so interactions happen here, and then we have uh, various subdetecting systems that uh, provide the high precision tracking and vertexing, start starting from the vertex locator and uh, going to two tracking systems. And this uh, is uh, complemented uh, with uh, uh, particle excellent particle identification capabilities that are provided by two uh, uh, ring uh, imaging Cherenkov detectors and colorimeters and muon stations. Uh, so the detector will be upgraded uh, for the uh, U1 phase, which is uh, starting in March uh, 2022. And the main goal of this upgrade is to increase the instantaneous luminosity by a factor of five. So in order to handle the increased uh, rates, uh, all uh, subdetectors are undergoing uh, major upgrades. And the upgrade that I will be focusing on is the trigger upgrade, which is actually going to be uh, software only. Uh, for uh, the new um, runs of LHCB. So the reason why uh, the experiment is moving to a triggerless readout is uh, because uh, in LHCB, uh, the uh, L0 uh, uh, rate of the hardware trigger uh, has a limit that would uh, saturate fully hadronic uh, uh, modes. As you can see uh, in this plot where you see uh, the uh, 
uh, normalized trigger yield as a function of the luminosity. And already here at the red, we were at uh, the run two conditions. And you can see that for uh, various interesting hadronic signatures that LHCB cares about, we had already reached a, a plateau. So in order to uh, fully exploit the um, the available statistics at uh, the uh, uh, upgraded uh, LHC, uh, uh, the collaboration has decided to move uh, to a trigger uh, to a remove uh, completely the hardware trigger and uh, read out the full detector at 30 megahertz and then to implement a fully software trigger that's based on track and vertex reconstruction so here i'm showing you the uh, data flow of lhcb for run 3 as i mentioned we have the full detector readout and then um, we move uh, to the software trigger the data is received by around uh, 500 FPGAs and built into events in the event uh, building uh, farm servers. And there we also have a two-stage software trigger. Uh, first, we have the HLT1, the first level, which performs a partial event reconstruction and a course selection, reducing uh, the rate to uh, 1 megahertz. And then we have a second stage trigger uh, that performs the full event reconstruction and uh, implements a more uh, uh, complete uh, selection procedure. So the reason why we have split into two uh, stages is because in between we can uh, implement a buffer and perform a real-time alignment calibration, calibration. So after the HLT2, uh, we have around 10 uh, gigabytes per second of data for offline processing. So uh, going now to the uh, upgrade options that the LHCB was considering for the uh, upgrade, uh, here you can see uh, two uh, possible uh, data flow architectures um, uh, that uh, the collaboration considered. The first option was uh, an evolution of the run two uh, 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 strategy where we would have uh, the full uh, data sent to a CPU processing server. However, because of the increase, the vast increase in amount of uh, data, we would need an additional network. Uh, and the second option that the collaboration um, investigated was to uh, look in the event building server to uh, fill some additional slots uh, with uh, GPUs and reduce the uh, rate uh, locally to one terabit per second before going to the full processing with uh, CPU servers. So uh, in order to um, answer uh, the question of which of the options is best, uh, we have to see if GPUs are a good fit uh, for the LHCB architecture. So here you can see the event uh, builder farm that is equipped with around 173 servers. And each of these servers uh, has a three free PCIe slots that can be used uh, to host the uh, GPUs. They also uh, provide sufficient cooling and power. And uh, if we consider uh, GPUs as self-contained processors, meaning they uh, read the uh, entire data and uh, output entire data, uh, then sending data to a GPU is uh, pretty much equivalent to sending data to a network card from the architecture point of view. This means that we have a very good mapping of uh, GPUs uh, to the LHCB architecture. And an additional advantage is that HLT1 tasks, uh, which are uh, heavily based on tracking and vertexing, are inherently parallelizable. Uh, and uh, then we can also achieve a smaller network between the uh, event building server and the CPU HLT. And uh, so in overall, we have a cheaper and more uh, scalable uh, system. Why, which is uh, why it was chosen as the baseline uh, for the upgrade and will be implemented with around uh, 200 NVIDIA RTX A5000 uh, GPUs. So going a bit now to the uh, software uh, platform of uh, this uh, new trigger, uh, this is uh, the uh, Allen uh, uh, software project that you can find uh, here. It's a public uh, uh, GitLab repository. And uh, so it supports uh, three modes. It can be run uh, standalone or uh, with uh, compiling with the LHCB framework, either for data acquisition or simulation and offline studies. Uh, it uh, supports uh, running on CPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, that will be the default uh, of LHCB, as well as uh, AMD GPUs. And the code is written in uh, CUDA, while cross-architecture compatibility uh, is ensured uh, via macros. And um, so, now looking a bit at what uh, this uh, trigger uh, software has to do. Well, first of all, it has to uh, reconstruct uh, events at LHCB and uh, tracking is uh, at the core of, uh, of the HLT1 uh, reconstruction. Uh, here you can see a schematic view of the tracking stations of LHCB. Uh, and uh, first we have the uh, uh, 
uh, vertex locator, which performs uh, the initial clustering, uh, tracking, and vertex reconstructions. Then tracks are extended to the upstream tracker that is located before the magnet, where uh, the track reconstruction continues, and uh, this detector uh, aids in improving the momentum resolution uh, of tracks as well as rejecting uh, fake combinations. And then after the magnet, we have uh, the scintillating fiber detector that uh, completes the track reconstruction and uh, since it's located after the magnet performs uh, the uh, momentum measurement. Uh, then uh, not shown here, uh, we can, we, but we also have uh, some uh, particular identification uh, capabilities in HLT1, particularly we have a muon PID from muon station as well as uh, very recently uh, calorimeter uh, information. So after we uh, have reconstructed uh, our events, we um, perform uh, some uh, trigger uh, uh, decisions based on uh, inclusive uh, trigger lines and we select events for further processing. Uh, so now uh, let's uh, look a bit at uh, how the performance of this uh, new system looks. Uh, as I said, we have a 30 megahertz goal uh, uh, for uh, processing uh, in HLT1, and this uh, can be achieved uh, with uh, around 200 GPUs, because if we look at the throughput uh, of uh, each uh, of a GPU uh, that, uh, of the technology that we uh, care about, we see that uh, right now we are at uh, uh, more than 150 kilohertz uh, per GPU. So we can uh, easily achieve uh, this uh, goal with around 200 GPUs and the maximum of the EB server is actually 500. So we are well within uh, the uh, hard limits of the system. Then we can also look at uh, the uh, throughput as a function of the theoretical flops of a GPU card. And we see that we have a very good uh, scaling and uh, this uh, shows us that we have uh, our algorithms uh, have uh, good uh, parallelizability and they take advantage of the full power of the GPUs that we are using. Uh, and uh, given uh, this very good uh, performance, right now the collaboration is exploring additional algorithms such as uh, seeding and downstream tracking uh, for uh, long-lived uh, particles uh, uh, in uh, HLT1. Uh, now let's look a bit at the physics performance. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, managed uh, to uh, uh, achieve an excellent uh, track uh, reconstruction efficiency. Here as you can see uh, the efficiency as a function of the momentum for velo and, uh, high and uh, forward uh, tracks uh, after uh, the magnet. And you can see that we are above 99 and 95% uh, respectively. And uh, we also achieve very good uh, momentum resolution, as you can see here, as well as uh, fake rejection. There's also been uh, compatibility studies between the performance uh, of CPU and uh, GPU uh, architectures, and uh, uh, there has been uh, it has been it has been proven that uh, results are uh, highly compatible, and you can see uh, more in this uh, publication. Uh, but uh, going now a bit uh, to the uh, particle identification performance, here you can see the uh, muon identification and uh, MIS-ID background rejection as a function of uh, momentum, and you can see that we achieve uh, excellent performance uh, here as well. And uh, going now to the uh, selection, uh, as I said, uh, the inclusive rate for the main HLT1 lines uh, should uh, stay within the one megahertz limit, and so far, uh, with uh, the main lines have been implemented uh, in the trigger software and we are uh, within this limit. And here you can see uh, the efficiency, the trigger efficiency as a function of the uh, transverse momentum for uh, two uh, of the uh, most important uh, track uh, uh, trigger lines uh, for BS255 and DS2KKPi uh, events. And here we see very uh, uh, highly compatible uh, performance between CPU and GPU and uh, the tuning of uh, uh, the selection lines are uh, currently ongoing to achieve uh, maximum performance. Uh, now I would like to spend uh, a bit of time uh, discussing the integration of Allen in the online system. So as I said, uh, um, data taking is expected to start uh, in uh, spring 2022, so commissioning activities are uh, going in uh, full swing. 
And the challenge of uh, commissioning uh, uh, any kind of trigger, including Allen, is that we need the real detectors and the event building server first. So um, we are very uh, dependent in the schedule from the other systems. Uh, however, in October 2021, uh, we already had the two week LHCB uh, beam test, where LHCB uh, ran uh, with upgraded reach calorimeter and immune station for the first time and uh, successfully tested Allen in the LHCB experiment control uh, system, uh, both uh, with GPUs and CPUs, uh, in pass through mode, meaning that we were uh, allowing uh, all. Uh, uh, data through and uh, with a simple calorimeter activity trigger line. Here you can see a screenshot of the uh, LHCB uh, ECS uh, running and Allen is included and uh, with uh, and triggering on data based on this calorimeter activity line and you can see how it successfully reduces the output rate. Uh, this was a major milestone for the commissioning of the trigger. However, uh, we have um, uh, many things uh, to do uh, before the beginning of data taking. So as more subdetectors uh, get installed, we will be commissioning more uh, parts of the decoding, reconstruction, and selection chain. Uh, we also need uh, to commission the full uh, chain going from the uh, servers to the two uh, uh, software triggers and the storage offline. So with the testing that I mentioned previously, we tested the first uh, two steps, so going from EB to HLT1. And very recently with simulation, we also tested the third, uh, successfully tested the, this uh, third uh, part of the chain. Um, then uh, we will also, uh, we are also uh, working uh, intensively on implementing monitoring uh, for the trigger and uh, we are in parallel continuing the installation of GPU cards in the LHCB data center, as you can see with the various uh, figures here. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, once the installation is uh, complete, uh, we will be performing throughput memory cooling and stability tests with a larger scale system. So uh, this uh, brings me uh, to my conclusions. Uh, so LHCB is currently undergoing its uh, first major upgrade to increase its instantaneous luminosity by a factor of five. Uh, there, uh, there are major changes on the trigger strategy plan. Uh, we will be removing the, completely the L0 hardware trigger and reading out the full detector at 30 megahertz. And uh, this is the first time a uh, uh, hadron collider experiment is uh, uh, trying this out. So we are very excited. And we will have a new software only first level trigger based entirely on GPUs. Uh, we have so far implemented the partial event reconstruction and trigger selection lines with, uh, and we see excellent physics performance. We have a very good uh, throughput and uh, we uh, see that we can realize our system with around uh, 200 GPUs. And we have a lot of work ongoing for commissioning in order to uh, be ready for uh, data taking in uh, the spring. And uh, so recently we tested for the first time Allen in the LHCB uh, control system uh, and with uh, triggering on uh, real uh, experiment, uh, real detector data. Uh, and uh, for the future, we are now installing uh, GPUs and uh, heavily involved in commissioning activities. So uh, stay tuned uh, for more updates. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Uh, are there any questions for Christina? I cannot see any hand rise uh, yet, but uh, I have maybe a very simple and naive question regarding this. When you say the partial event reconstruction, do you use the information of the full detector or do you use only the, the innermost part? So uh, the uh, the point uh, that here, uh, what I meant with partial event reconstruction, we use uh, the full information of the tracking uh, but uh, we, for instance, uh, we don't uh, use the uh, ring imaging Cherenkov, so the PID is uh, not complete. Um, and uh, also uh, the algorithms that we are implementing are more uh, simple. Uh, for, insta uh, they are, for instance, the fitting of the tracks uh, is, the parameterization is a bit more simplified than in the full reconstruction. So we still, um, uh, we, the second step of the reconstruction is still uh, very useful uh, to have uh, the more accurate uh, uh, estimates uh, of the event. But uh, when I say yes, uh, for the tracking, uh, we use uh, full information uh, from the tracking stations as well from the muon and calorimeter. 
Uh, and what is the the time that you need in this buffering uh, that you have between the the trigger one and the two? You have this uh, a buffering for the alignment, right? And calibration. Uh, yes, I, I have to say I do not remember uh, by heart uh, the uh, the latency of this uh, buffer. Uh, just curiosity. Yeah, but yes. Thank you very much. It was a very uh, nice and interesting presentation. Looking forward to see it and operating very soon. Thank, Thank you very much. And then uh, and now we move our next, sorry, next speaker, uh, which is uh, Sami Goss from uh, LLR in France. And he's going to talk about the challenges and reconstruction techniques for the uh, CMS, high granularity coloring term. Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. And well. also, you can see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll be uh, talking about challenges and novel techniques that we use for uh, CMS high granularity calorimeter reconstruction for the HLLHC. Right, so this is uh, the roadmap for HLLHC, and this is where we are at the end of the long shutdown, too. So, so far, the performance from LHC has been uh, excellent and exceeding initial expectations but we have just begun by collecting only a small fraction of the total expected data and what we're really looking forward is to the hllhc where uh, there will be five to eight times of increase in the nominal instantaneous luminosity that we can get and so this will also result in a whole lot amount of data and this will provide an excellent opportunity for higgs and standard model precision tests as well as bsm searches but this will actually come with a price of having a whole high amount of pileup, so which, which will go to 200 collisions per bunch crossing. And in the left-hand side, there are plots. Uh, these pictures show how dense or how busy the events will be. So there's, there'll be a whole amount of uh, activity inside the detector. So all this will actually lead to a huge high amount of radiation level. So one year of operations at HLLHC will be equivalent in radiation to about 10 years at LHC. And the parts of the detector which should be affected the most would be the end caps. So in CMS, we will replace the end cap calorimeters that we have now, the electromagnetic and the hadronic calorimeter with one uh, uh, detector, which is the AGCAL. Um, so this AGCAL is a highly granular and radiation hard end cap calorimeter. And uh, so this is a sectional view of what it looks like. Uh, it has broadly, it can be uh, divided in two parts. So the front part, which, which is inside this red part, uh, it's called the electromagnetic part. So it's made of 26 layers of silicon and each of these layers look like this and it's made of uh, small hexagonal silicon sensors. And these silicon sensors are 0.5 to one centimeter square in area. Uh, so this entire electromagnetic part corresponds to 28 uh, radiation lengths. So the hadronic part is, is uh, encircled in this, uh, uh, in, inside this blue part. So this looks like this. So this has more uh, a more interesting structure. So, it, uh, so the first seven layers are made of silicon, just like the electromagnetic part. But the last 14 layers are, have the silicon sensors in the inside part and has plastic scintillators on the outside part. Uh, and this course, the entire hadronic part corresponds to about 10 uh, interaction lengths. So one can see this a huge amount of uh, granularity uh, actually gives a huge amount of signals coming out of the detector. So just from the silicon sensors, there are 6 million channels. So it's uh, so all this uh, granularity actually gives us a very powerful description. So here is one simulated event in 140 pileup, and one can here clearly see all the tracks and clusters coming out from different particles in this huge busy environment. If one zooms in, so here one can actually see the longitudinal evolution of showers of individual particle showers. So these are one of descriptions which is thanks to this high granularity, and uh, this can give us wonderful physics results. But all this uh, uh, granularity, all lateral and long longitudinal uh, uh, granularity, uh, poses a problem for reconstruction. So if one uses just naive reconstruction algorithms to, for, by considering all possible combinatorics, that would actually lead to memory or timing explosions. And then an added uh, complexity is in trying to disentangle all the different overlapping showers, and they're, they will be very frequent in this high pileup environment. So for example, on the top right plot, where uh, in this curve, which is this uh, squared boxes with this line. So this is this, this, this line shows what are the expected computation we would require. And within this gray area is what we would have at that time. And in this plot shows what are the computational fractions that we will require for each of the processes. And one can see that a huge amount of computing resources will be taken up by the reconstruction processes. So clearly to go around this thing, 
one needs newer techniques and algorithms for, so uh, to do all the different kinds of steps for the reconstruction and for that one really needs to utilize the latest developments in computer architectures and modern tools like machine learning or graph theory also it, it's very important that there are efficient workflows which can also utilize information from other detectors like the tracking and the timing detectors so as to properly do the reconstruction Right, so uh, the framework that we have to do reconstruction in CMS is called Tickle or the iterative clustering. So this is a framework which produces 3D clusters of particle showers in the end, starting from HGL sensor hits. So this is heavily inspired from the very successful CMS on one iterative tracking strategy. So this is a, this is a framework which lets you uh, reconstruct particles in successive iterations. So uh, these iterations could be designed uh, depending on which kind of particles you want to uh, reconstruct or which kind of part of the detector you want to look at as a result. But in any case, uh, uh, whichever iteration you want to design, so it allows you to plug in plug in whatever algorithms you want for just part that particular iteration. So for example, you can choose which seeding uh, algorithm you want, which pattern recognition algorithm you want, or uh, particle property estimation or filtering algorithms you want. So all these things would be swapped in easily depending on which kind of particles and which part of the detector you want to look at. So and this framework rests heavily on at the heart of it is this clustering algorithm called Clue. So this is a 2D density based algorithm. And what it does it, it starts with, so for example, in this uh, diagram in the left-hand side plot, all these hits uh, coming out from all the sensors and it clusters them into all these hits which are coming from just a particular physics uh, object or it can also, and it also rejects all these points which correspond to noise. So it also re reduces noise very well. And what it does essentially, it actually reduces the number of hits that one can will use in later on all the steps of combinatorics by an order of magnitude. But it does not really sacrifice the performance. So for example, here on the bottom right, uh, this plot shows the difference of energy, which is reconstructed by this clue clustering from the amount of energy which can be reconstructable. And this uh, this is uh, this shows as a function of energy and also for different particle types, and this is very close to zero. So we gain back most of the energies that we have uh, with the, this clustering scheme. And the best part of this algorithm is that it's fully parallelizable and GPU friendly. So this, this really gain, gives us a lot of gains in terms of computation. Right. So once a uh, clue acts on this individual sensor hits, which we call wreck it, and then it forms this 2D layer clusters in each of the layers, but then a particle shower spans over different layers and one needs to have some pattern recognition algorithm to connect all these layer clusters uh, across all these different layers to build the entire shower of a particle which, uh, or the 3D cluster. And this is what we call the 3D trackster. And as part of the framework, there are a couple of pattern recognition algorithms already available for building these tracksters. And the first common thing between them is that all these, all these 3D clusters or tracksters have a graphical data structure. So in, in the bottom hand plot, you can see that, uh, so all these showers just represented as graphs. And this, all these, uh, and the nodes of these graphs are the layer clusters which are used. And the edges or the connections between these layer clusters are defined by some connecting algorithm. And then this connecting algorithm just assigns all these sets of points to be belonging to one particular cluster or the other. Um, so the connecting algorithms that we have right now are, for example, cellular automaton. So and this is showed in the right hand side, this plot. So which, so this algorithm just uh, tries to see if there are sets of points belong to uh, belong together by, by some angular criteria, and it also looks at if the that uh, that that set of particles are inconsistent with something coming out from the interaction vertex. So it uses all this German, uh, the angular information. And then there is also another algorithm called Clue 3D. So this is another energy density based algorithm, or for example, there could be fast jet. So there are all these different kind of algorithms available in order to cluster these objects. So by the, so pattern recognition really helps us in the final step of um, the clustering these objects properly and extracting them from the detector. Right, so we have uh, all these algorithms which let us uh, cluster back all the, the, the individual objects that we want to get out of the detector, which all are based, based on clue, which gives us this reduced hit multiplicity space to work on. And then we'll really look at how the iterative aspect of this works with an example. So here we will look at the electromagnetic iteration for which could be one uh, iteration for the pickle. Um, yeah, so in this iteration, the primary our primary motive is to just extract rid of magnetic objects first. So this could be uh, used for electron and photon reconstruction. So the first thing that we do is we mask all the layer clusters, or rather we keep only the layer clusters which are in the electromagnetic part of the detector and mask all the layer clusters which are deeper inside the detector. So we just focus on the electromagnetic part. 
And then we run our pattern recognition algorithm to form the clusters that we need, so which we call tracksters. So here is a plot where the efficiency of this tracksters building is plotted as a function of generated particle energy. And this is uh, flat at one. So we get back all of the uh, clusters which are coming from these particles. And this is at pile up zero. And things uh, become a bit more difficult when there is pile up uh, when there is pile up involved. So, for example, there will be a lot of contributions from hadrons all around. And so, for example, in this uh, small schematic, uh, so there will be a lot of hadrons which start showering early inside the calorimeter. So, for example, in the simplest case, this could be a pion which starts showering early, and then. Uh, this part in this iteration, this clustering step will uh, reconstruct both a photon which is in clean and also a pion which is in red. But one thing, but in the in the the philosophy of clustering or in the philosophy of iterative clustering, what we really want out of this iteration is to have very pure electromagnetic objects, and then we actually want to reject these pions so that these pions do not mess up the confidence that we have on this particular iteration, and rather these pions can be fed back to further iterations which would be uh, designed specifically for hadrons. So we get very pure objects coming out of different iterations. So in order to distinguish between this photon and this pion, so we uh, use state-of-the-art graph neural networks. So these graph neural networks are excellent at identifying all the geometrical properties which, which separate or which, which have the differences between the photons and the pions and, in, uh, and to distinguish between them. Um, yes, and so for example, this is a particular network which is built on based on edge convolutions and also greedy clustering based pooling, and this is designed just uh, for this uh, particular work. And on the right hand side plot are the discriminator stores, uh, scores, which show a, a very good separation between the photons and pions. And in the left hand slide, uh, side plot are the ROCs corresponding to it. And this is also, these ROCs correspond to different eta ranges, and one re can really see that they're very nice performances of more than 99% background ejection for 90% signal efficiency. So these graph neural networks are very efficient at actually separating out the uh, these, these pions or any sort of backgrounds from this electromagnetic iteration. So we really can end up with very pure electromagnetic objects. Great. But then uh, in the presence of pileup, there are further complications for this photon. So suppose this is one photon cluster. So uh, in the x-axis is the xy uh, coordinate. In the, in the y-axis is the shows the longitudinal development of the shower. So one can see here, this for this particular photon shower, there is a whole lot of junk which gets associated to the photon cluster from pileup. And in principle, we would really like to clean them up. So we also have a cleaning scheme which is in place so that this cleans all these pile of contributions uh, based on the shower geometry. And so starting from a picture like this, which has all pile up associated with the main uh, cluster. So we end up with the, uh, the cleaning scheme which really cleans this, uh, this uh, cluster so that we, can, we end up only with these blue points which are just the actual photon shower and we reject all the other points which are in red, which were coming from pile up. So this pile up scheme is uh, very nice and it gives this nice properties without really sacrificing the energy. So for example, on the left-hand side plot here, what is plotted is the difference of the energy that we get after cleaning and before cleaning. And this as a function of the generated particle energy, one clearly sees that the, this, this plot is very close to zero. So there is almost negligible uh, trade-off in terms of the energy which is reconstructed out of this. But what we get in return is firstly the plot to the right. So here the uh, the cluster energy, the ratio of the cluster energy to the gen particle energy is plotted as a histogram. And in red is the distribution, which is which we get after cleaning. So one can see that this is clearly a very much more symmetric shape than the one which is before cleaning, which is in blue. And so this symmet uh, symmetric shape actually helps a lot later on when uh, energy scale factors, for example, are being would be applied to correct for the energy. The other uh, interesting property that we get out of this is uh, when estimating the trackster uh, direction properties, for example. So this is a plot where uh, the absolute difference of the estimated trackster direction or the estimated cluster direction uh, uh, subtracted from the actual gen particle direction is plotted. And one can see here, so this red line, which corresponds to the situation which is after cleaning, which is much more sharper than the one which is there before cleaning. So what this plot actually tells us is that we get much more refined uh, directional estimates of these clusters. So this would lead to better kinematic properties of the reconstructed objects. And also this would help in uh, reconstructing much more complex objects. Like for example, it would help us in gaining back all the BREM fractions from a particular electron or for example, or pair prior productions. So, uh, so this uh, cleaning scheme really helps us in getting back much more purer estimates from the physics objects that we reconstruct. Right, so um, uh, 
At the end of this particular iteration, we'll have tracksters which will be getting filtered by the PID. So all the ions get rejected and they and just the electromagnetic, pure electromagnetic clusters remain. And also the layer, there are many layer clusters which get rejected by due, the, due to the cleaning. And all these layer clusters which get rejected, they get fed back to the original layer cluster collection. And then this can be used for further hadronic or MIP iteration. So the MIP or the iteration gets an entire whole set of whole, uh, good objects, which we, it can then later on use to build much more better, clean, cleaner objects than uh, some of the objects getting lost in other iterations like the electromagnetic iteration. So this is the entire philosophy of having different algorithms very much tuned for different iterations. And one then can tune this further hadronic or MIP iterations later on. Right, so to conclude, uh, reconstruction in CMS, uh, high granularity calorimeter actually comes, it's a very challenging job given the high granularity of signals that we get out of the detector and also the high pileup, which is there. But then we have a very modular and flexible network, which is in uh, a flexible framework in place, which lets us uh, do this job very well, which is called Tickle. And in the sense that one can design different iterations and one can have very specific algorithms, which are very specific for different iterations and then can easily swapped in or swapped out. So there's a wonderful framework to do all of that very seamlessly. And all of these base is based on this uh, energy density based algorithm called CLU, which is uh, fast due to its parallelizability. And then it also reduces the hit multiplicity so that all the later com combinatoric steps can be done with much less pain. And then finally, we have we, ex we explore a variety of strategies for individual iterations so that we can extract the best prof possible performance in pileup. Uh, so for example, we use latest machine learning, uh, machine learning uh, models and then also uh, cleaning schemes so that in the end, we end up with clusters which have very robust particle ID, have very robust energy regression and also different properties which can then be used for a very optimal particle flow interpretation coming out of, uh, so we, we use all that information to make the best possible inter particle flow, uh, flow in interpretation of this physics event, which we have. So moving on to the next step. So all these lessons that we learned on all these things, uh, all these uh, plugins that we develop, so this will be used for uh, making more effective strategies for hadron reconstruction. And in the end, finally build much more stronger, robust particle flow objects and physics objects so that we can get much better physics or uh, we get physics performances as we desire with this new uh, detector. So yeah, th that, that's all. Thank you, thank you very much uh, um, for such a complete uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? I don't see any happen probably what is uh, just a curiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is the impact that you have uh, of the uh, geometry of the detector? I mean, the, resolution in, the, in the, the spatial resolution that you have. Do you think that this is something that is um, a limiting factor or you are not affected by that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the spatial resolution definitely helps uh, when uh, when the, the, there are very nearby particle showers or, or the showers which are very close together. So for example, disentangling them, then the geometry is very mm -hmm. useful. And then certainly it's a very important parameter when designing, when having this amount of granularity. Yeah, but, uh, you, you don't you don't have a, a, an idea what is the the resolution that you have now in the reconstruction on on the oh. one. Oh, oh right so for example we can so you uh, have how much can you distinguish two showers that are uh, Right, so uh, we can distinguish electromagnetic showers which are, for example, one point five or two centimeters apart. Okay, so yeah, I think this is due to the geometry of the sensors. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any hands up. Uh, thank you again, and thank you all the speakers so far for the excellent timing performance as well. We are we are doing uh, surprisingly very well on time. So and then we move to to the next speaker, who is uh, Johann Sebastian Media from uh, Davis University of California, and is going to talk uh, about the update of the cathode strip uh, uh, chambers on the moon system for the CMS detector at LHC. We can see your slides uh, now on full screen. So whenever you want, go ahead, please. Great, fantastic. I'll get started. Well, um, hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, my name is Johan Sebastian Bonilla Castro, and I, my pronouns are they, them. 
Um, I am speaking to you on behalf of the CMS collaboration, and I'll be sharing with you some um, updates and news on the upgrade effort uh, for the cathode strip chambers of CMS in preparation for the high luminosity LHC. So in store for today's uh, talk, I will start off with some basics, giving you the, the what and the how of the CSCs. I'll then motivate why it is that we need to upgrade them for the HLLHC. Uh, then I'll choose a few examples that, uh, that I've been working on, particularly uh, during this lunch shutdown too. Um, and, uh, and then at the end, I'll leave you with <clears throat> some forward-looking um, you know, thoughts on run three and future upgrades still to, still to come. So the, the CMS is, is one of four major uh, experiments uh, using the LHC, and the LHC is a particle accelerator that's managed by the CERN laboratory uh, just between France and Switzerland, many of you already know. So if you have been there before, maybe you might recognize this image, which is right at the main entrance of CERN and the globe uh, right at the tram stop. But the, the, the point of today's talk is going to be about CMS, which is across the ring in a, in a town of, in France called Sessy. So we're just coming out at the end of uh, this lung shutdown too, and preparing uh, to start up for run three, which should run uh, from this spring uh, for about three years until the end of 2024. The end of run three will then mark the beginning of the high luminosity LHC era, and all the uh, updates that I'll mention about to you is aiming towards that goal in mind. And just to uh, finish up uh, uh, just to close the loop here, where I'm talking to you today is from this little house um, in the French countryside in the commune called Baisenas. Uh, so hello from France. On my next slide, slide four, I have the timeline of the HLLHC project as a whole. Um, so on the left side, it, we have run one. And uh, if you remember, in July 2012, both the Atlas and CMS collaborations jointly announced uh, the discovery of a new scalar boson that we believe uh, to have the same properties as the Higgs boson. And uh, this, this, uh, um, this diagram that I have here is a Higgs candidate uh, that was collect, uh, recorded by the CMS uh, collaboration and were, which uh, the case to muons. And I just wanted to highlight how important uh, these muon systems are for not only the Higgs physics program, but uh, many other uh, physics programs of, of uh, the two collaborations. Where we are is at the end of this lung shutdown two period, um, where I have this uh, golden star right at the end, right at the beginning of 2022. So we're going to have run three, which should start in the next few uh, few months, uh, and then at the end of 2024, we'll have uh, the third long shutdown. And and this long shutdown three is actually part of the HLLHC. However, most of our upgrades happened uh, during lunch shutdown too. And this uh, has to do a lot with uh, the other kinds of upgrades that are happening in CMS. Uh, we just heard from the, a, the high granularity calorimeter, for example, that's gonna be doing most of its upgrades or most of its installation in LS3. So that, you know, that limits the amount of things that we can do and hence why we, uh, we're doing this work now. And then coming up, um, starting in 2025, is this HLLHC, and here I put a, an example picture of what we expect um, that kind of data to look like, and my point of putting it here is just it's very busy, much busier than we had before. So. The CMS detector itself uh, is a general purpose detector with the tracking right at the very center. Then we have the electromagnetic calorimeter just around that, the hadron calorimeter then uh, beyond that. Then there's the, the, the solenoid, which uh, is this white um, cylindrical thing between the yellow and red parts. The protagonist of the, my talk today is uh, the muon system. And I've painted it here in red, however, the CSCs are these on the end caps are actually these off-white trapezoidal looking objects. I'll explain this in a little bit more detail coming up. The total cost of building CMS, the detector is, is somewhere uh, close to about a half a billion Swiss francs and the amount of money in, invested in the upgrades um, is, is uh, totaling somewhere around 200 million um, Swiss francs. So on my next slide, slide six, I'm gonna try to explain this, the cathode strip chambers a little better. So here I have a cross section of CMS where the interaction point is uh, right at the origin, the zero zero point on the bottom left hand side. This black arrow that I have is the beam line. So you're kind of looking um, from the side of CMS and you're only looking about a quarter of it. The left side of this, um, of this uh, figure that you see here is part of the barrel. So in the barrel, we have drift tubes and resistive plate chambers to be able to see these muons. But on the end caps, uh, we have a different kind of technology. We have the CSCs, which I'm outlining here in this uh, green line. 
Uh, and these CSCs work together with RPCs, the uh, resistive plate chambers. And more recently, we've installed um, these uh, new gas electron multipliers, which are these G11 and G21. So G21 is still not quite installed. G11 is. Um, G21 will be installed in the future, but they all work together as a single uh, you know, muon system. However, we they're, they're, they are separate subsystems. Each CSC, um, again, here I have uh, the, the picture and it's kind of trapezoidal shape, um, is made up of six layers of wires and strips, right? The anodes and the cathodes, and they're in this gas mixture. So when a muon comes by, uh, it ionizes this gas that sits at a very high potential. And uh, when you ionize this gas, you create an avalanche of signal that is read out by the anode and cathode electronics. The good thing uh, about CSCs, or one of the great things about CSCs, is uh, how it can uh, work well in non-uniform magnetic fields. Uh, you see here in, in the, the solenoid magnet that's right in the middle, in, within um, the cavity of that magnet, we have a very uniform magnetic field, and just on top of that as well. But on the sides, you have turning around, you know, these fields uh, have all sorts of different shapes, and CSCs happen to be really good for that particular job. In addition, the amount of coverage that the CSCs provide is between 0 0.9 and 2.4, so the very forward regions. But as, as I'm trying to show here, it is um, you know, almost half of all of uh, CMS. Um, what I have here uh, outlined in in in, um, in pink is I'm trying to uh, what I'm trying to to illustrate here is that by putting the two inf the information together we can um, read out the strip uh, charge. And that gives us a, a, we can get a resolution somewhere between 50 to 150 microns um, on the individual strips, right? Now, if you put these together as a whole system, right, um, you, you know that the, the muon passes from one and then another and then another, and you can reconstruct this, put those two, all of those together and get a resolution for your muons in time, for resolution of time of around 2.1 uh, nanoseconds. And I mentioned here that it's actually a 4D position. And the reason that is, is that we also know the Z position of these chambers very, very well. So CSCs actually measure all four um, of, the, uh, of the coordinates that we are interested in. But now, why is it that we need to upgrade the CSCs? There is a collision energy increase with the start of REN3 going from 13 to 13.6 TeV. Uh, and the luminosity is staying at approximately the same level that it was during REN2. So the detectors actually should be able to handle REN3 quite easily. What really is the issue is the uh, HLLHC upgrade in its luminosity. So the full design is still going to go even higher for its energy in center of mass of 14 TeV. However, the luminosity is going to uh, cross five and possibly even seven, uh, seven and a half times the LHC nominal. So this plot that I have on the bottom right is with the x-axis is the instantaneous luminosity. So the nominal LHC luminosity is right around one, where we sit uh, with run two is uh, where the number two would be. But the HLLHC is somewhere around five at least. And as you can see here, these original electronics are not going to be able to cope with this. The, the y-axis here is the amount of uh, events that we lose because the, the, the electronics can't cope with it. So one way of, uh, one way of, of, of thinking about this is, is the level one latency that we get from the triggers or something we need to cope with, right? Um, we need to uh, conserve many more events on the chamber itself, and there are many more events happening at any particular time. So it's, it's, a, it's a compilation of both of those things happening that we really need to increase the amount of memory that is, a, that, that is on uh, the chamber itself. So the first thing that is affected are these cathode front end boards. Uh, they definitely need more memory. Um, so they're going to be the, uh, replaced with these digital uh, cathode front end boards or DC FEBs. In addition to that, um, there are other uh, parts, which I'll mention in a bit, that need strong, uh, more powerful FPGAs in order, uh, with larger buffers in order to cope with these kinds of, um, uh, with these kinds of conditions. So, with these new electronics, you also get an increased power consumption. Uh, and that means you need to provide the power, which isn't the infrastructure that wasn't there yet, and we needed to upgrade that. Finally, we also uh, needed optical readout. Copper is just not good enough for us anymore, and we need to upgrade to an optical readout. So on my eighth slide, I have a schematic of the electronics of the CSCs. So I'll explain what this is in, in my own way. So first we start with the low voltage distribution and monitoring board. These are on the chamber itself. This is what actually powers the different onboard electronics. So here the anode front end board, the cathode front end board, and the uh, what we call the ALCT that puts together the, the information coming from the AFEPs. 
Now, in addition to that, we also have the optical trigger motherboard and the optical data motherboard that sit on the periphery crate. So this is still in the cavern, but it's just uh, not quite on board the on board the chambers. They talk to each other via the trigger system, and then they also talk to these uh, onboard electronics. Um, so the trigger uh, the trigger system sends sends um, like a, a what we call level one accept signal, uh, and then that exports uh, the data that we need into the front end driver that also has this uh, detector dependent unit. That's what we use to export eventually to the CMS data acquisition system. So again, stepping back a second again, uh, I have here the timeline of, uh, of, of the HLLHC with run one on the left and run four uh, on the right. So in phase one, uh, we knew we were going to have problems, as I was mentioning in, some, uh, in a plot that I had before. So one of the first things we attacked was that we, we upgraded the CFEBs into DCFEBs for the ME11s. These are the ones that are closest to the interaction point. Because they uh, needed more power, we needed to also uh, update the infrastructure for the low voltage system for it. Another thing that we did um, is that we installed a whole new station during uh, phase one, and it happens to be this top right uh, green set of stations, this ME41. And then we also needed to uh, upgrade the trigger electronics uh, needed to support uh, the system as it was growing. So let me bring you back, bring your attention back to this ME11 that I've just uh, highlighted in, in orange. So the DSC FEBs that were in there, they, they were uh, installed in LS1. However, we knew we also needed to install this uh, for the other inner rings. Um, but by the time we actually got to phase two and we were ready to, to install this, we noticed that we could actually use the best technology that we had available for the ME11s and recycle the things that were already in the ME11s into the other ones. So that's what we did. We grabbed the stuff that was in the ME11s, we put those in the inner rings and uh, in the other inner rings, and that saved us some money. And then we also have that the most critical component has the best technology. To support all of this, again, we needed to upgrade the low voltage system. Um, and in addition, we took the opportunity to upgrade the high voltage system for the ME11s specifically. And this is uh, for better control. Another thing that we did was uh, we, I mentioned earlier, there was some FPGAs on these mezzanine cards that needed to be, um, that needed to be more powerful or have more buffer. So we did that with almost all of our chambers with the exception of the somewhat newly installed 4.2 chambers. And of course, there's also trigger electronics that need to be upgraded. And this is ha still happening now. And there's still some to be done uh, during LS3. In total, about 180 of these CSCs were dismounted. They were upgraded on the surface and then reinstalled again underground. And then 288 additional ones, all of these that are actually in the outer rings, were able to be upgraded in situ. And where we are right now is here we're finishing up this uh, upgrade to the trigger electronics and about to start uh, run three. In the next couple of slides, I have uh, some examples. So this is uh, the <clears throat> mezzanine board that we were replaced. We had different types depending on the kind of chamber that it was gonna be on. Um, on the other hand, on the right-hand side, I have here a picture of the DC FEBs. So these were one of the recycled ones that I just mentioned that were going from ME11 to the other, uh, the other inner rings. And the thing that I wanted to point out here is if you notice, this is uh, some of the important bit that's uh, that it now has, it's now capable of optical readout. So these were all replaced, the, 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 what you see on the left, these mezzanine cards, most of them were replaced in situ, whereas the DC FEBs, they were, had, they did have to be dismounted. The CSEs had to be dismounted and upgraded. My next slide is on uh, upgrading the power. So I mentioned that we needed to satisfy a new power requirement due to the electronics. Uh, we had more current being pulled, so you needed more power. We installed 12 new power supplies, which are these blue boxes. And those then get distributed to the individual chambers via the junction boxes. So, so I, I, this was actually one of my first tasks when I joined CMS about two years ago, was to build some of this. In addition, we replaced the low voltage distribution boards that I'm outlining here in orange um, for each of the inner rings. So it's 102 uh, chambers that we had to do this to. And um, the, the general power flow is that it goes from the power supply to the junction boxes to the low voltage distribution board that eventually then gets fed into these DC FEB. For ME11, this was already done. Uh, so the, the high voltage is what we were able to do during this uh, long shutdown too. 
Um, another example is a, a cooling loop upgrade that we did for these ME11s that are the, the most critical ones to us closest to the interaction point. On the left side, you see the old, um, the, the old system, and on the right, you see the new. So all of the onboard electronics are contact cooled. However, the old one had an issue, and the issue is that they had joints. And whenever you have joints, you have the risk of, being, uh, of it leaking. So we decided to go with a new design that's a, a whole single circuit and avoids this in the, whole, uh, in the first place. So we had to replace this, take off all the electronics, put the new cooling system on, replace all the electronics, and, and uh, install it back into CMS uh, for 72 of these chambers. So here I have a little uh, I have a little movie that I'll let loop while I explain this. Um, so th the general uh, flow is that we brought the chambers up and then we refurbished, we put the new electronics on. We tested to make sure that those uh, electronics were working fine. Then we were able to put these on these transport uh, fixtures that fit about six of them at a time, take them underground um, and put them onto this other fixture that we hoist with the crane. And then, so, so as you can see, this is a quite complex choreography to be able to do this. And in addition, during COVID, it was, it was quite tough, uh, not only because of the, 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 the task itself, but also because of the personnel, the lack of personnel that we had uh, on site. So finally, we install and commission onto CMS, and we do this for 100, over 180, uh, for 180 chambers. One of my last slides here is uh, an event display that was recorded no, uh, just past midnight, November 1st. Um, and here I have, uh, it's, it's a beautiful um, event display where the reconstructed, uh, the reconstructed candidate here is of 3.1 uh, GeV in, in the invariant mass, which is you know, a candidate for a JSI. So this here used a uh, real proton-proton collisions produced by the LHC um, quite recently, but they were not at full energy, they were at 900 GeV. But still this shows that we were, you know, we were capable of recording muons again, and they were the first muons that we had seen in a few years since the end of run two. So this takes me to um, my, sorry, my conclusion slide. And that's me on the right-hand side, uh, uh, posing with the very last CSC to be installed uh, about a, a little over a year now. Um, so all of the CSCs have been, uh, the CSC upgrades for LS2 have been completed. All the electronics have been updated. The low voltage and high voltage systems for the respective chambers have been upgraded. Everything is reinstalled onto CMS and the, uh, the commissioning work has began, began early last year. In addition, we've had successful tests, um, this one in, in October of 2001 with, uh, with full magnet on, um, and uh, showed you, just, just showed you uh, the, the success of that with, with our event display. Uh, what we're doing right now is integrating the trigger of this new GEM subsystem with the CSCs and preparing for uh, Run3 and LS3. So Run3 is expected to begin very soon in the spring of this year. Um, and then we also have some, uh, some projects in mind for uh, Lung Shutdown 3 uh, that would happen at the end uh, of Run3. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Johan. It was a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, do you have any questions from the audience? I don't see any, any hands up. I have just one question about this GEMS, uh, new GEMS uh, trigger system. Um, what, are the, what are the major improvements that this will incorporate into the uh, MUON system of CMS? I believe I believe one of the so part of it is the rate right that we're going to have in the HLLHC so it helps reduce the rate of our trigger um, and and in addition to that it also improves the resolution I believe is in the bending angle but don't quote me on that I'm not I'm not thinking quite right 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 now but the gems do increase so it's it's in twofold it's one is the trigger and the other it's in the actual resolution of the nuance. Okay, thank you very much. We have a look again on the hands up. Uh, no, I don't see any. So uh, thank you again, Johan. And then we move to the, I believe it's the last presentation of the, of the session is uh, going to be given by Hector Garcia Cabrera from TMR in Spain. And he will talk about, um, again, going back to high granularity calorimeters and exploring the structure of uh, hydronic sour and the hydronic energy reconstruction with highly granular calorimeters. I can see your slide, so whenever see, you want. Yeah. You hear me? Yes. OK. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about this um, exploration analysis uh, of the structure of uh, uh, abdronic showers 
uh, with high granular calorimeters that I'm presenting uh, on behalf of the CALIS collaboration. So first, as an introduction, what is CALIS? And quoting the collaboration main page, uh, the answer is uh, the CALIS collaboration is an R&D group of around 280 physicists and engineers from around the world working together uh, to develop uh, new high granularity detectors for high energy E plus E minus experiments. These detectors are being developed for possible future experiments like ILC, CLIC, uh, FCEE, CEPC, and smaller projects like LUX at DESI and others. One of the objectives of this uh, E plus E minus experiment is to perform high precision physics me measurements and also model independent Higgs analysis to study the Higgs properties and possibly extend this analysis to the discovery of new particles beyond the scope of the LHC. One of the main technological challenges for this model independent analysis is a jet energy resolution of about 3 4%, allowing the identification of the C or the W boson in a the case. The approach selected uh, to reach these resolutions was to implement particle flow algorithms in the context of these experiments. These algorithms aim to individually reconstruct particles using the most appropriate subdetector for the energy and momentum measurements. This picture uh, shows a representation of an event in this type of uh, detector where every type of particle produces uh, a track and has energy depositions in the calorimeters. Uh, the contributions need to be separated and identified to uh, efficiently apply a particle flow and for that both gold energy and resolution and high transversal and longitudinal granularity should be provided by the calorimeters. Now the science of the of these prototypes is uh, or um, these uh, different calorimeter technologies are currently under study by the CALIS collaboration. Uh, you can see here the history of CALIS in 2005. Uh, in the first row there are some of the physics prototypes that uh, later evolved into technological prototypes and in, that are shown in the second row. Um, these uh, all were developed by CALIS teams, testing silicon and scintillator tungsten electromagnetic calorimeters. And in the hadronic part, there are scintillator prototypes with steel and tungsten absorbers and also GRPC based digital calorimeters. Besides the ones shown here, CALIS hosts other smaller projects and technologies and also inspired the development of the CMS high granularity calorimeter. The design of these prototypes, as I said before, is oriented towards the usage of particle flow algorithms. However, to build reliable particle flow algorithms, a detailed study of the calorimeter response to particle interactions is necessary. This implies the precise simulation and reconstruction of the interaction of neutral and charged hadrons using the subsequent uh, particle cascade. Uh, this simulation were carried out with the MOCA framework, which provides a geometry interface to GN4, in which several interaction models are combined into the simulation models. These are the hadronic uh, simulation models studied, uh, but of course these models are not perfect and require validation from the test beam data. These results are the comparison between the beam test data and the Monte Carlo simulation for different physics lists. The um, data was taken with the digital HCAL in the left and the siliconical physics prototype in the right, both at Fermilab. Results show, on one hand, from the digital HCAL, um, a strong dependence of the response and energy resolutions on the electromagnetic uh, simulation models for the positron and the pion showers. Well, uh, being this QGSP BERT EMC physics list, the one that shows the overall best agreement with the data. And on the other hand, on the, in the silicon ilk analysis, the Monte Carlo simulations reproduce the behavior of the hadronic showers within a 10% discrepancy without showing a clear preference for one simulation model. For example, here, this is the mean energy fraction of the interaction region at several beam energies where the slope is properly reproduced with these values within a 10 percent. Now, ideally, in particle flow algorithms, only the energy of neutral particles is measured in the calorimeters, while the charged particles are reconstructed in the tracker, where the resolution is much better. Since the great majority of particles in an event are charged, this approach intrinsically improves the jet energy reconstruct the resolution from the traditional approach. Then, the capability of particle flow algorithms to recover neutral hadrons in the vicinity of a charged hadron is of crucial importance because of misassignment of energy that will recreate the energy resolution. 
one of the most developed particle flatons in the concept of the ILC is Pandora, and is the one used by default in the reconstruction chain. The performance of these algorithms has been tested with the large ASCAL physical, physics prototype, both with the data from pions from 10 to 30 GB and simulations of the ILC detector. This validation will provide further evidence that the particle flow reconstruction obtained in a simulation of the ILC detector concept is realistic. To reproduce this study in the scenario with the HCAL, two hadrons events have to be overlaid and the track of one hadron before the shower start is removed to emulate the neutral hadron. And later, this event is mapped into the ILD geometry. Several distances between the shower axes have been tested, where at small distances between particles, the shower overlap is considerable. The mean energy of the neutral hadron recovery is typically lower than the corresponding energy measured in the calorimeter prototype. Nevertheless, the results from the data in Monte Carlo are in good agreement, demonstrating that uh, the extrapolation to the complete detector is reliable with the qgsp baird physics uh, model, giving the better description of the test beam data. Another study, uh, another particle flow algorithm study in the Arbor is the Arbor approach, studied with the SDH Cal technological prototype, with data of pions from 80, 10 to 80 GBs, with a, which with test of single particle reconstruction and multi-particle separation have been performed. This algorithm is based on the idea that the hadronic shower development follows a tree-like topology, following a principle close to the underlying physics. Here's an example of this. Uh, um, shower with all of its components. In the single uh, particle analysis, the heat cluster inefficiency, the heat cluster inefficiency is uh, defined as the fraction of heats proper, uh, heats properly assigned to the hadron, and it shows a constant uh, efficiency over 96% in the studied energy range. Since the number of heats in the prototype increases with the energy of the hadron, the number of missed it also increases, and also does the mean number of reconstructed particles due to the shower speed. For the case of the multi-particle separation, similar to the Pandora analysis, pion events are overlapped, testing several separation distances. As expected, at lower distances, uh, the confusion grows larger, giving an efficiency of recovering a neutral hadron higher than 90% down to 10 centimeters. The mean reconstructed neutral uh, energy remains flat for all distances, showing that at small distances, the neutral hadron reconstruction is either very good or merged into the charged hadron. Also, the mean reconstruction, reconstructed energy increases with the energy of the overlapped charged hadron. Um, and also, the, uh, uh, because uh, as the energy of the hadron increases, uh, a non-negligible part of the charge heats are assigned to the neutral hadron. These results show uh, the capabilities of these technologies to apply particle flow algorithms. These algorithms also may benefit from improvements coming from a deep knowledge of the hadronic shower structure. And thanks to the high granularity, it is possible to study the longitudinal and radial shapes and properties of the hadronic showers. There are several analyses of many topological properties here I show two separate analyses. The on the right, uh, a study performed with the digital age scale prototype showing the case of 40 GB pions about values of general properties like the 2D and 3D densities of heats uh, corresponding to the mean number of neighboring heats in a plane or a cube respectively. Transversal properties like the radius of the shower, longitudinal properties like the length of the shower. These uh, results support the high quality of the technological um, imaging capabilities. These results uh, below represent the longitudinal and radial energy densities, which can be separated into the electromagnetic core in blue and the halo part in green, uh, as is shown here, uh, with shape parameters that can be computed from a fit to the data. This analysis was performed with the analog Hadronic calorimeter prototype. Another ability, thanks to the high granularity, is to compute secondary tracks within an hadronic shower. Each technology has developed its particular algorithm, being a backwards iterative finding algorithm like the siliconical or hue transform based in the case of the hadronic calorimeters. 
results show quite a, a good agreement with the Monte Carlo simulations. The identification of um, secondary tracks is a quite powerful tool. For example, in the case of the uh, semi-digital ladonic calorimeter, low energy particles that stop inside the calorimeter may have hits with uh, high threshold values. These hits within a secondary track may bias the energy estimation. Therefore, giving the same weight for all the hits in a track has a small improvement into the energy reconstruction. Also, the information from the secondary tracks could be used in the particle identification process, particularly with the, within the context of the multivariate analysis. Efficient identification of particles is a key ingredient to successful particle flow algorithm to avoid the double content of particles. Thanks to the high granularity, it is possible to use topological variables to identify the particle crossing the calorimeters. This image here shows the distribution of the center of gravity along the beam direction versus the number of hits in the calorimeter. This was computed with the ASCAL data. And these accumulations represent different types of particles. However, since these accumulations overlap, um, additional observables are needed to properly uh, make the particle identification, giving rise to the multivariate approach. This method make use of uh, machine learning techniques where a set of topological properties are the input that uh, classify an event as signal or background. The method developed by the uh, semi-digital adonic limiter uses a boosted decision tree method with these uh, variables as input that are represented in this figure for the different particle types uh, comparing data and Monte Carlo simulations. Later creating two classifiers, one to separate showers from muons and another to separate the adronic uh, from the electromagnetic shower. This is the output of these uh, PDTs where there is clear an accumulations corresponding to the particle types. And then by applying a cut to the output of this PDT, uh, it is possible to separate the type of particle. Finally, these two classifiers are applied in order, first the pion muon classifier and then the pion electron classifier, giving the final set of events. Results show a significant statistical gain with, gain with respect to the standard method and with a stable performance over all uh, uh, the study energy range. Also, a BDT method is currently being developed and trained with the simulations of the full AHCAL prototype, showing uh, in this plot uh, early results of the separating power over the simulated energy with an excellent performance for all simulated energies. Mm. In addition to the standard reconstruction methods, it is possible to apply software compensation techniques in the case of non-compensating calorimeters, like is the analog hadronic calorimeter, to correct the different response to an hadronic shower. Typically, smaller than the response to an uh, electromagnetic shower of an initial uh, energy particle. These methods consist of correcting the shower energy with a set of linearis linearization coefficients <laughs> tuned using a set of negative pion samples or weighting differently, weighting differently the low energy heats dominated by the hadronic component from the high energy heats dominated by the electromagnetic component. These methods have been applied in the context of the AHCAL with the tungsten or steel absorbers, respectively. The energy resolution results uh, show an improvement on the, uh, in the case of the steel absorber from a 10 to up to a 20%. And in the case of the tungsten absorber, the improvements are not so significant uh, due to a better level of compensation in this later case. And Finally, it is uh, in the scope of many technologies to include precise timing information to study the complex time structure of hadronic showers. Here I show results from early timing measurements with the analog hadronic uh, calorimeter uh, with both tungsten and, absor and steel absorbers with a heat time resolution of around one nanosecond. And as the calibration muons show a uh, time resolution of around six nanoseconds. While the case of electrons, the time resolution is of 10 nanoseconds due to the high heat occupancies. For the case of pions, a tail appears due to the low energetic uh, neutrons. These tails become more prominent in the case of tungsten absorber because of the higher atomic number. 
However, this resolution is not for precision measurements. It depends on the electronics. Better resolution is expected in the future in the order of a few hundred of picoseconds. For example, in the case of the glass resistive plate chambers. With this, I reached the end of the presentation. And as a summary, the prototype, uh, the prototypes developed by the Kalis collaboration uh, has a high reality, which is a key, key component to reach the, an unprecedented jet energy solution needed for the future A plus and minus experiments. The imaging capabilities of these uh, calorimeters allow for many analysis like the, tally, the detailed hydronic shower structure, validation of jet for models, calorimeter based particle identification, particle flow improvements, uh, improving the, also the energy reconstruction within the calorimeter itself, and the timing measurements uh, show promising early results. Many other analyses are currently under development, and if you have more if you have interest in the technology of these prototypes, you can find more information in the poster called Implementation of Large Imaging Calorimeters by Robert Bosley. And that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Hector, for the presentation. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? If not, I would like to, to ask you about the particular identification efficiency. Uh, you mentioned yes. it, but um, can you elaborate a, a bit and uh, give me an idea on how good are you identifying particles with Kali's? Well, uh, currently the all the data is recorded in beam test uh, con uh, context, and um, there are two. The classical, let's say, method of uh, particle identification is using just a, a set of cut to different variables without using any machine learning. And in the case, in that case, you have a purity of your beams, your final um, set of data of pions. It is usually the the uh, studied particles of around ninety percent. You have a tails in that energy distributions that represent leakage in the detectors, but you have a very high um, um, efficiency of selection. Uh, the selection of muons coming from uh, the uh, halo in the beam are also very high. Uh, the real problem here is the separation of the uh, electromagnetic and the hadronic showers, but applying a let's say stream cut in to the start of the shower, you have a very pure selection of, uh, of data. However, with these cuts, the, what happens is that you lose most of your statistics. That is what why uh, these uh, machine learning techniques were developed to improve this, um, this amount of statistics. But from start, thanks to the high granularity, you have very pure um, selections. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Uh, so that this was the, the last uh, talk of the session. Thank you all the speakers. We have been on time. And uh, I, I, I know this is difficult and very difficult. Uh, there is a lot of more time for discussion and you can always go to the matter, uh, mat, matter most. And, uh, and chase the speakers if you want to have further discussion. Some of the presentations today were very dense, so I'm sure that uh, there is a space for, for questions and discussions. And uh, there is uh, another session after the break on future experiments, and tomorrow there is another session on R&D and a second one also in future experiments. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference and um, see you around. Thank you again. <laughs>